George Seldes was like the, the trombone of muckraking journalism. His voice was so clear, so loud and strident, if you like. He took what should be the most honorable term in American journalism, muckraking, and made it work again. I consider the fight for a free press the most important fight in the world today. In the new dictatorships, the free press has died, and freedom with it. In the United States, dictatorial big money and big business is trying to destroy the foundation on which free government is built. Seldes saw the growth of powerful publishers who lack competition in ideas and politics and, and economic competition, and who became more and more visible as the protectors of wealth and of power, economic power. Many publishers have fought to hide their prejudices, but their record in just the past year is clear. One, fought all issues where their profits were involved. Two, urged amendments of proposed social insurance legislation, putting newspapers in a special class. Three, opposed the Wagner Act, the Magna Carta of Labor. Four, favored child labor. Five, proposed compulsory arbitration of labor disputes with the outlawing of strikes. That's an indictment, you know. No wonder I wrote this book when I had all this material. In Lords of the Press, Seldes took on his former employer, Colonel McCormick, exposing his anti-labor bias and red-baiting rhetoric. Publisher William Randolph Hearst had amassed a vast news empire stretching across the nation. Seldes traced Hearst's evolution from people's champion to fascist sympathizer. He profiled every major publisher from Boston to California, from the Daily Tabloids to the New York Times. He painted a picture of an industry run by a handful of wealthy men with no concern for the public interest. The press needs free men with free minds, intellectually open. But its leadership consists of moral slaves whose minds are paralyzed by the specter of profits. George Seldes wrote in the tradition of the muckrakers. Strong language, strong adjectives, outrage. He expressed a feeling that was not popular generally within the news business and about which the general public was not very informed. See, one of the guaranteed zones of silence in our news is news about the news industry itself. Newspapers like kings pretend they can do no wrong. The press greeted Seldes's books with silence. Reviews were scarce. Ads were refused. Regardless, his books found a receptive audience. By the late 1930s, growing numbers of Americans had involved themselves in political and social issues. As they did, they discovered their own experiences were at odds with what they read in their daily newspapers. They grew increasingly frustrated, skeptical, and outraged that their perspectives were not represented. Labor is fighting for more rights and privileges. Strikes have been labor's weapon of progress. But labor realizes that strikes cannot be successful unless there is public sympathy, and that public sympathy or antagonism is manufactured by the press. Seldes was this saving remnant of a voice saying, now wait a minute, this is a very complicated world that has many things in it, and we're getting a press that seems to be narrower and narrower all the time, and that if you no longer let the community hear all its significant voices, you begin to have a single narrow view of the problems of society, of the solutions of society, and you become sooner or later overwhelmed by a society that you don't understand. As soon as I could read, I read newspapers. And when I was about maybe 12 or 13, Somebody gave me a copy of this small newsletter. 
which had stuff in it I didn't find in any of the newspapers. The idea that there was someone out there putting out this thing, I imagined he did it all by himself, that he set, set the type, did the reporting, went out there and took on the whole journalistic establishment as well as the larger community. It was inspiring to a kid who didn't know what he wanted to do in life, say, hey, that would be a great thing to do. It was not George Seldes, but his close friend, writer Bruce Minton, who first suggested starting a newsletter together in 1940. In fact, for the millions who want a free press, that was the subtitle. And the whole thing was that, that we claimed that uh, news was being suppressed, and it was. In fact was something new. Not only an alternative source of news, but the nation's first weekly critique of the press. We started on a small scale, a four-page, I think it never went be beyond four pages, and uh, we had no difficulty getting enough material. But there were other difficulties. Minton was a member of the Communist Party, which had provided, in fact, startup money. He expected, in fact, to reflect the party line. Seldes agreed with party positions on occasion but he refused to compromise his independence. The two men fought over every issue. Finally, I said, look, we'll have to quit. Either you take the magazine or I take it, you see. And then he decided that half a loaf was better than nothing. A liberal weekly was, if he couldn't make it communist, then let it be a liberal weekly, all right. So he, so he quit. George's wife, Helen, took over production editing copy and supervising a small staff to get out the massive weekly mailings. But story selection and writing were George's responsibility. From the beginning, Seldes had refused all advertising, calling it the most corrupting force in journalism. In fact, would have to survive on circulation alone. He was a maverick. He was a loner. But he had a classic uh, tabloid journalist's instinct for the big story and a, and a flair for putting it out in a sensational way. This is the story of profiteering and phony price fixing unparalleled in U.S. history. The Atlanta, Georgia Bureau of the Associated Press insisted that no Negro could be addressed as Mr. and Mrs. and changed a reporter's copy. Two New York dailies ran their bus strike stories last week opposite a full-page company ad which read, If you had to walk to work today, blame the Transport Workers Union. What was, in fact, it was press criticism. But what was the motivation of the press criticism? It wasn't gossip or nastiness. It was, you guys are keeping the public from knowing things they should know. People responded to Seldes' insights and revelations about America's press. Starting with block sales to labor unions, in fact attracted thousands of new subscribers. It soon surpassed the combined circulation of the two leading liberal journals of the day. He was not interested in speaking to the traditional audience of the Journal of Opinion or the counter-establishment press, which is generally intellectual and elitist. He was interested in talking to the rank and file, to the strap hanger, to the guy or woman in the street, to the masses. Dear Mr. Seldes, we used your expose from the House Munitions Investigation in our latest organizing drive. Dear Mr. Seldes, Mr. Murray appreciates your calling his attention to the soldier labor problem. Dear sir, we need more brothers like you to make this a better world to live in. Along with the labor audience, in fact, appeal to the next generation, young people trying to make sense of the world. It was special because it uh, alerted me instantaneously to the issue of social justice. As a kid growing up in a steel town uh, in Ohio, was really not very conscious of the kinds of things that Seldes uh, concentrated on. I really can remember quite a bit about the specifics he gave of how the press distorted the news and framed, as we would now say, uh, one's perception of it, the way in which, for example, uh, photographic captions might be at odds with the actual story, or the headlines could be at considerable odds, and the headlines would carry one impression, uh, whereas the, if you read the text carefully and if you read to the end of the text, you'd see that the, uh, the facts were considerably different, and that all these reflected editorial judgments and eventually 
publishers' judgments and, and uh, advertisers' judgments and establishment judgments. It gave me a sense of priority uh, that uh, the uh, analysis uh, and documentation of uh, power was important in understanding uh, the future of our country and the world. Uh, it certainly was in contrast to what we learned in school and what we uh, heard on radio in those days.